welcome to all of you, and welcome to you joining us through YouTube and through Facebook. You know, for uh, the past two and a half years, we have confessed, I believe in the Holy Christian Church. But what does it mean? What does it mean to believe in the Holy Christian Church? Certainly it does mean, as we have confessed in the explanation of the small catechism to this, that the Holy Christian Church is a creation of the Holy Spirit, working through the good news of Jesus, calling, gathering, enlightening, and sanctifying people on earth in union with Jesus in the one true faith, forgiving sins, in the promise of being raised from the dead with eternal life. Still, there are many, many ideas out there about what the Holy Christian Church is to be about. Which ones can we count on? Which ones are just somebody's ideas? It would be good to know. So in this summer series, we consider Jesus' ideas about his church, the Holy Christian Church. We do so through the letters that Jesus, in a vision, told John to write to seven congregations. We do so to be encouraged by the promises of these letters and what Jesus considers good ideas for his church, for the leadership of his church. Good ideas for you and me. And so we begin in the wonder of God that we have and know through Jesus. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand.
begin in the wonder of God, known and expressed hundreds of years before Jesus. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Yet, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Majestic is your name in all the earth. You may be seated. We pray to grow in seeing, appreciating, and receiving the wonder of God. I invite you to join me in this prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for revealing your goodness in creation, your covenant with Israel, and your Son. Jesus, how much have we missed of what you have shown us and done for us? Help us to grow in seeing, appreciating, and receiving your kindness and truth and love and power and forgiveness. And help us to grow in sharing it with others by the power of your Holy Spirit, who with you and your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is one God, now and forever. Amen. We can count on God's faithful answer to this prayer. The words John says in his letter to the seven churches that are in Asia are for us, for you today. Grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We hear our readings from God's word. Our first reading this afternoon is from Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, and chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and is to come, the Almighty. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The Gospel reading for this afternoon for this Sunday is from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. A lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit the eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to testify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, and when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. stand and join us in saying a, 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 singing a um, inspiring tune called Who You Say I Am.
invite the kids to come up if they like. Oh, we got two. Do you want to have, have a, you want to sit in those chairs there? How about that? Excellent. So we're going to be talking about the church and things we can expect from the church. And I was wondering, what kinds of things do you expect from the church? Katie, yes. Learning about Jesus. Learning about Jesus, of course. Yes. Zainab? You told me one before. Would you like a cookie? No. How about you, Sadie? Sadie was trying to get them off of me earlier. You sure you don't want one, Zainab? No. Okay. I think it's great that we can expect things like cookies from the church and, of course, to learn about Jesus. Anything else come to mind as you think about what kinds of things can we expect from the church? Okay. Learning about indigenous culture and being good to people that have been here from way before other, other rest of us came in. Yeah, that could be a good thing for us to learn. Any other ideas? How about, how about this? What kinds of things would you like to hear from the church or to be able to expect from the church? Yes? More about, I wish Sunday school was still here. Ah, <laughs> I wish Sunday school was still here. That's lovely. I'm glad that you do. Yeah. Well. You know, I think there are many wonderful things we can expect from the church. One is, look around. Isn't it awesome to see people and see them Sunday after Sunday and have nice conversations with people you care about? That's something I expect from the church, and it's lovely. Yeah, you agree? You agree? Excellent. Well, thank you very much for helping, and we're going to hear more about what you can expect from the church from seven letters that Jesus wrote. Well, tell John to write to the churches. But thank you very much for helping. A cookie, a cookie to go? Would you like a cookie to go? Cookie to go? There you go. I figured you'd have one to go. Cookie to go? Well, you got to put one in there. All right, well, you put it in there. Excellent. And we're going to put it on the altar as one of the things we offer to God is things like cookies. Excellent. Really to thank you girls for helping out. It was a great beginning to this message about what we can expect from the church and to uh, how valuable it is to have letters literally from heaven. Letters from heaven. Letters that John heard from Jesus, who is risen and ascended to heaven, and in a vision heard, hey John, I want you to write these letters to seven congregations in your day. Seven different congregations. Letters we're going to be considering for the encouragement that they offer us. And we start with this. Jesus sees, appreciates, and understands the unique situation of each one of these different congregations and does not say the same thing to them all. Because he doesn't expect the same thing from them all. He writes to each one in their particular situation, seeing, understanding, and caring about where they are. And that's good news for you today, because Jesus sees, understands, appreciates, and cares about your life situation, where you are, and he has something to say to you today about that. A word of encouragement. Encouragement, a word to give you courage as children of God. So be encouraged that Jesus, in writing these letters, is seeking to offer encouragement, not just to a church from 2,000 years ago, but to us today. Today we're going to speak particular about the encouragement that is given from the letter written to Ephesus. Ephesus, beautiful, prosperous, multicultural, self-assured Ephesus. One of the biggest cities in the Roman Empire, 
and an important seaport that advertised itself as the first and the greatest metropolis of Asia. The first and the greatest metropolis of Asia. And they could back it up. It was also a very popular tourist destination, mostly for the possibilities offered by the temple of the goddess Artemis. The temple was one of the seven wonders of the world at that time. And it offered answers to prayers, including for healing, sex with cultic prostitutes as part of the worship, and sanctuary to anyone, whatever they had done. So criminals particularly liked finding sanctuary in the precincts of the Temple of Artemis. All of this made it a very challenging thing to live in Ephesus and to be a follower of Jesus and a faithful Christian congregation. As can be seen by the experiences of, the, of Paul in Ephesus that are written about in the book of Acts and his letters to Timothy and the church in Ephesus. So Jesus speaks into this very challenging situation as the one who has the power and authority over all the church. And so he speaks this into this situation of people living in a place that's self-advertised and thought of itself as this great and wonderful and powerful place. And so Jesus speaks to that situation as he starts out by saying, this is written as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. If you've looked back at what's written in the revelation of the vision in chapter 1, this is making clear that Jesus is saying that he has all power and authority over the church. He holds the leadership of the church, the seven stars, seven angels, the messengers that are in charge of the church. He holds them in his hand. He's got them. He leads and guides them. And he walks among the seven gold lampstands, which are the seven churches that he's writing to. He's saying, I'm right there with you. It may seem like I'm not there, but I'm, I'm there. I, I'm, I'm with you. And in the midst of this, with the challenging the situation they faced, he commends, he commends the leadership and congregation of Ephesus. He commends them for their work and their toil, and their patience, and their endurance in the face of all the evil that they face every day living in Ephesus. He commends their strong moral principles, their criticism of the Nicolaitans, who appear to be a group who basically said, you know what, when you, when you believe in God and you got Jesus, it doesn't matter what you do, you can behave any way you want, it doesn't matter. And so then they were quite happy to engage in all the opportunities that they had to behave in the way that everybody else in Ephesus behaved. So he commends the church in Ephesus for their strong moral principles their patience and endurance and hard work in seeking to be this Christian witness in this city by saying there is a right, there is a wrong. Do the right. This is encouragement for us today as a church and as individuals. As we seek to follow the teachings of Jesus in a culture that basically says anything goes and everything is relative and every single individual they're the ones that determine what's right and wrong. It's a challenging situation and challenging place to live as people that believe that God has made clear there are some things that are better and some things that are not good at all. And that those who are wise seek to live by what God's word makes clear is better. And seek to help those who don't to understand there's a better way. Part of that better way certainly includes the Ten Commandments, but it's broader than that. I'm not going to get into the details of it today. Simply, I think you get that picture. There's things that you believe that are right, and that you seek to live your life by, that you understand that you're swimming against the tide on, and that it's challenging and difficult. 
You get that. And there's more encouragement for us in this. And something that Jesus says he is not happy about with the church in Ephesus. There's actually for encouragement for us in this. He says that they have abandoned the love that they had at first. Taking into account Paul's letter to the Ephesians and the pride-based culture that they were very much living amongst, it seems that they are all doing all this moral stuff. They're doing all this right-wrong stuff. Judging others for what they think is wrong or they believe the Bible says is wrong or the Bible does say is wrong, but judging them for that and judging them for their rightness in doing what is right, they're doing it all of a sense out of being right. Instead of acting out of the love for Jesus that they had at first. Those are very different things. It's a very different thing to do the right, to tell others they're doing the wrong, out of a sense of being right. We're supposed to love Jesus. And seek to do what because you love him and you know him, God has said it's better, so you, you're seeking to, to do that for yourself because it's better not to be right because you know you're not. And to desire it for others, not because they're wrong, because it's better for them. And you love them. You don't judge them. See, isn't that freeing? Doesn't it set you free to know you aren't the moral judge of your family, or even yourself, of your neighbor, or this community, or the world? You're just simply somebody that God has made clear to you His love. And you know, you know His love. You know His love for you and for the world. You know it in Jesus who died on the cross to make clear to the whole world, this is how much my Father in heaven loves you. And he rose from the dead, so you go like, well, he's not a nutter. He was right. It's all true. God loves us that much. God, I love you. Well, whatever you say, God's got to be for the better. So we value what he says. We don't value being right, because we've proven to ourselves over and over and over again that we're not really good at that. Otherwise, Jesus didn't need to die on the cross. But we value what God has to say because we know it's better for us and for other people. We love them. We just want for them what God wants for them. We don't judge them. Isn't it sweet to be set free from carrying the weight of the wrongness of the world and your family and yourself on your shoulders? See how, see how encouraging it is that Jesus says to Ephesus, what you're doing, I mean, I, I see what you're doing, I appreciate what you're doing, but guys, you're doing it from a completely wrong basis. It must be really hard to be doing it from that basis. Let me set you free from that. Remember your first love. Remember the love you had for me when you found out that I was expressing to you the love of the creator of the universe? Remember that. Remember how you used to act out of that love, in love for yourself, in love for people? Remember that. Repent of going astray from it and just do what you did at first. Love God. Love me. Love people. Value what God says. Not as about being right or wrong, but as about what God has made clear is better for all of us. Seek to share that. And as we do so, we do so remembering that the Bible promises Bible promises. 
Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him. He always lives to intercede for them. So we confess our faith in God and we start to do so with a song called He is Able. Donna and I learned this song when we lived in Britain in my first call, which was to the Evangelical the Church of England. And this was one of the songs we got to learn then. So this is going back a few years, hey Donna? <laughs> Oh, over 30 years ago, I remember the first time I heard this song, I thought, I love this song. And it so fits what I'm seeking for us all to receive from this summer series on the letters of Revelation. Encouragement. Encouragement that God is able to handle everything. So the first time through, Don and I are going to sing it. I think you're going to join me. Yes. Excellent. And then the second time through, I'm going to invite you to stand and we'll sing it two times. No, second time through. Sit, 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 sit. <laughs> Don't feel bad. I listen about as well as you do. So. <laughs> our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I invite Brittany to come forward for our prayers.
Father. We thank you for your presence here with us today and always. We ask you to help us shine your light in our communities. Help us to love our neighbors as you love them. You know their needs, spiritually, emotionally, physically. Work in us to provide for those needs in your name. God, we ask that you be with the political leaders here in Canada and around the world. Work in their hearts and minds to fill them with kindness, empathy, and wisdom. We pray for St. John's. As the process of rebuilding continues, we thank you for your hand in it. You've blessed this congregation with so many talented, hardworking, and passionate people. Thank you for them. Keep reminding us of the reason we're doing this. It's not about a building, it's about your church. Be with us during all decision making, so our space will be a space to do your work, work to fulfill your mission. We pray as well for our EBS program starting soon. Be with all our participants and volunteers so that everyone has a fun and safe week getting closer to you. We also bring before you the people in our own hearts and minds right now. We ask all these things, and in Jesus' name, he promised to pray. Our Father. We go by the goodwill of God we know in Jesus, the love of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. We go to live in the love of God and to share the love of God. The reading from Luke assigned for this day about the parable of the Good Samaritan is another example of what Jesus is saying to the church in Ephesus about the freedom of doing the right thing out of love and out of some moral obligation or desire to be right. He's challenged by the uh, teacher who wants to be right, but who is it right to love as my neighbor? As if there's some that it's right to and some that it's not right to. Jesus doesn't answer that question. He tells the story of the Good Samaritan and then says, which one was the name? He doesn't answer the question. He tells a story and gives him a different question, which the guy has to answer. Well, it's the Good Samaritan. You see, he wants us to set us free from the silly notion about who's right to love and who's wrong to love. Because loving God and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves is to love people where they're at and in their need. We all have needs. It's that simple. Another example of being set free from the need to be right. Sweet encouragement. What's also encouraging in this, though, is to recognize I don't have to feel this love to do this love. That's encouraging to know. It's not about feeling the love. It's about knowing that that's what love looks like and just do it. Not to be right, but because that's just what you do. And we've got the power of the Holy Spirit to help us. The teachings of Jesus to guide us and the assurance of the love of the Father for us and for all. How can we possibly have any problems? Go in peace. Serve the Lord. <laughs> so many of you heard me say this so many times. Nothing funnier than people, and we're people too. <laughs> and so the reality is that we're going to go and we're going to fail. We're going to go and we're going to fail. So, oh, man, I'm back here again. And 
here being the place where I'm not living completely in the love of God, and I'm not loving people in their need, and I'm, well, what the heck happens? Well, I'm, I'm a person that's living in this fallen creation world as a part of the fallen creation, and so, again, encouragement from the letter to the Ephesus, Ephesians. Remember, repent, and do. It's that simple. <laughs> like, all right, I remember. I remember God loves me. God loves everybody. That's the Jesus thing. I repent. Okay, I got it wrong again. Thank you for your patience with me, by the way, God. Like, I think it's five minutes ago I was doing the same repentance. And then you just do it again. What do you do? What you do is seek to live in God's love for you and God's love for people. It's that simple and that hard. Isn't it? But that's what we go to do. And there's a further encouragement from the letter to Ephesians that we have in doing this. Encouragement that when we do this, when we seek to live in this kind of faithfulness to our faith in Jesus and God, there's this amazing promise that he concludes this letter to the Ephesians with. He says, he who has an ear, and it also would include this, she who has an ear. Anybody here not have an ear? Okay, apparently this is to all of us then. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, these are promises to the churches. So the promises at the end are actually to all churches, but to all believers. But they're written in a way that they become particularly meaningful when you understand the situation of those particular believers, in this case in Ephesus. To those that are in this place that people come to from all over the world, literally from all over the world, for healings, and magic offered by the temple of Artemis to those that seek to continue to live in faith in Jesus all their earthly life. This is the promise. Everlasting joy, eating of the tree of everlasting life with Jesus. In paradise, the garden of God which is way more wondrous than all the incredible beauty of the Okanagan. I mean, <laughs> Ephesus. Yeah, that is the point, isn't it? What is yet to come, we have not yet fathomed. And it is good. So be encouraged. receive this encouragement that Paul offered to the Corinthians, because we go to be letters from Christ. Written not on tablets of stone like the Ten Commandments, but written with the Holy Spirit working in your heart and my heart. You are a letter from Christ, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And in the name of Jesus, the Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, and the Lord look upon you with favor give you peace and new life. Amen. I invite David and Ava to come up and bring our worship time to a close with amazing grace.
not the message in this song, and I'm actually going to start singing this song uh, Saturday night for a while. Anybody else? Maybe not so much. So I invite you to stand and uh, drown me out. <laughs>